Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Gareth. And I'm Sabrina. And today we're going to talk about Akira Raptor. We have an interview with the team behind the game Saurian and some dinosaur news. But first, you may have noticed that we sound a little bit different. And that's because we met our first Patreon goal, and we bought some new equipment. Garrett spent a solid three to four days researching every type of equipment possible within our budget. And now he knows pretty much everything you need to know about mixers and microphones and anything you would need for podcasting or making music. <laughs> Yeah, I went a little bit off the deep end. But I wanted to say a quick thank you to Susie, Val, Cole, and Brendan, who all contributed to our Patreon and made it possible for us to get some new equipment. And I also want to mention, we have a couple interviews, like the one today with Sorian and another one in the near future, that still aren't going to sound that good because we didn't have the new equipment when we did those interviews. But going forward, things should sound a lot better. Yes, thank you very much. So now on to our news. At the Rocky Mountain Dinosaur Resource Center in Woodland Park, Colorado, paleontologists unveiled the replica of a potentially new dinosaur nicknamed Ava that has no official name yet. And they did this via live stream on YouTube, which is pretty cool. Actually, there's a lot of new ways people are utilizing live streams, and we actually we talk about that a little bit in the Saurian interview. The dinosaur is a ceratopsian from the late Cretaceous, and with laser scanning and 3D printing, they filled in the missing parts of the skeleton. And the bones were discovered by Mike Tribal, the president of Tribal Paleontology, Inc., and founder of the Rocky Mountain Dinosaur Resource Center in Montana, and it includes some mummified soft tissue in the hip that have 80% of the skull and most of the bones. It's described as a cute dinosaur, about three to four years old, and it's similar to Ava Ceratops, hence the nickname. But according to Ceratopsian specialists, there are no other known dinosaurs like Ava, so she probably is a new species. Next in the news, David Button, a paleontologist from the University of Bristol, gave a talk at the British Science Festival about new developments in paleontology. He said scientists can look at the cell structure of bones and they know, quote, many dinosaurs were teen mothers. They reached sexual maturity and started breeding before they were fully grown themselves. In bigger species, the babies would put on 500 kilograms per year, only reaching full size in their late 20s, end quote. As an example of how little we know about dinosaurs, he said that skeletons give us a rough idea, but if you looked at just a skeleton of a camel, you would never know that it had humps. Button also talked about how paleontology uses nanotechnology to figure out the colors of ancient animals, as well as CT scanning and 3D models to figure out the bite force. And so, for example, we know T-Rex's bite force is three times more powerful than a modern crocodile's. And they also use a new technique called evolutionary modeling which uses computer code to figure out all of an animal's possible movements and learn its gait. Quote, Sadly, the Velociraptor is not as fast as the movies would lead us to believe at 39 kilometers per hour. It also turns out that Velociraptors were not that smart, maybe duck smart, but not chimp smart. There's not much evidence to suggest raptors hunted in packs, but we do think they did probably hang out together. End quote. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm guessing what they're referring to there is how we've talked about in the past with the spongy bone, meaning that it's still a growing dinosaur. And then on female birds, you can tell based on their bones when they're making eggs. So if you got the right bone combination of egg making and sponginess, you'd assume it was a teen mom, I'm guessing. Next in the news is a new app in the App Store on iPhone and iPad called the Ultimate Dinopedia. Complete dinosaur reference. It costs four ninety nine, and it includes text, artist renderings, and videos. It also has pronunciation guides, which sometimes are a little hard to find. We've become familiar with from doing this podcast. Yes. And it mostly focuses on individual species with some information about the fossilization process. And looking at it on the App Store... I learned that there's actually a lot of these dinosaur reference, you know, basically ebooks turned into apps. This one specifically was a book, and they've now turned it into an app to make it a little more interactive and probably bring kids into it a little bit more. So 
It looks pretty neat. It's made by National Geographic, so I'm assuming that it's pretty accurate. I want to compare a few of these in the future so I can maybe give a recommendation for the best dinosaur app that we've tried. So stay tuned for that. We've mentioned Jurassic Quest before. That's a traveling exhibit with more than 50 life-size animatronic dinosaurs and also fossil digs and dinosaurs being inflatable mazes. But our patron and listener, Cole, thank you, Cole, sent us a link to Discover the Dinosaurs, which is a similar hands-on traveling exhibit, except they have 60 life-size dinosaurs, also animatronic. Dinosaurs are placed in 8 to 10 scenes, with each one reflecting a different period of time, and kids can ride a T-Rex. And also like Jurassic Quest, there are inflatables, but they also have mini-golf. And this exhibit is also, again, a traveling exhibit, and we'll post the link on our blog so you can see when it comes near you. In November, a juvenile Allosaurus skeleton is going up for auction in the UK, and the early estimates are suggesting that it might sell for up to $750,000. The skeleton is about 9 feet long, which is about half the size of an adult, so some people are calling it cute. Yeah, apparently that's how they're marketing it, is get this cute dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if any skeleton is really cute, but I guess so. Some of the Ceratopsian ones are kind of cute, I guess. I'm sure Ava is cute. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> I guess Ava is pretty cute. Yeah, I know it reminds me a little bit of the auction of Sue, the T-Rex, just because when they were doing the early estimates, I think they were thinking one or two million dollars, and it ended up going for 18 million dollars but that's obviously a much more sought-after specimen since it's so huge and imposing. And like we've talked about before, everybody likes their dinosaurs enormous. <laughs> so I don't know how much a juvenile smaller theropod will go for. Well, possibly 750000 <laughs> It might go for more. We'll see. So we've talked a little bit about Jurassic World 2. I wonder if that'll be the actual name, by the way. But anyway... <laughs> It won't be in theaters until June 22nd of 2018, and according to one source, June 7th, 2018 in the UK, which seems really strange for the UK to get it first. I don't know, but... Maybe there was an auction. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. So there's already a lot of speculation about what we can expect to see, and one leaked storyboard is revealing that there's going to be a plesiosaur an ichthyosaur, and several people are even mentioning that there might be a Utah raptor. I think that's a little weird that they're mentioning a Utah raptor because we've said before that the quote-unquote velociraptors in Jurassic Park are basically Utah raptors without feathers. So maybe a Utah raptor would be like the size of an allosaurus? I don't know what they're going for. But then they... <laughs> It'd be interesting to see them side by side, though. Yeah. Maybe a Utah raptor would have feathers. Yeah bring it in that way? I don't know. Then they also say there's going to be an Allosaurus, a Giganotosaurus, which would also be interesting to see. I'm sure if there's a Giganotosaurus, they'll have to have a battle with the T-Rex because that's their general theme too. Same with an Allosaurus. Yeah, that's true. The Allosaurus is isn't that a little smaller. Yeah, it's slightly, but they've yeah. got bigger hands. Oh, they do. Yeah, they do have that. I actually am kind of excited about the Plesiosaur. I mean... You probably noticed that our email address is plesiosaur at Ino Dino, even though it's not a dinosaur. But yeah, plesiosaurs are pretty cool with their long necks and their nessy looking bodies. Keeping on the movie theme, there's some news about a good dinosaur. Disney Pixar unveiled some new footage at the Toronto International Film Festival, which showed some of the T-Rex group that's voiced by... A.J. Buckley, Anna Paquin, and Sam Elliott, who is known for his beef, it's What's for Dinner ad, in 2000. Apparently, at one point, Elliott uses some cowboy lingo, and Pixar did a lot of research on ranchers when figuring out his character, which is named Butch, how to portray Butch's personality. And last, another thank you to Cole for sending us this link. It's a link to one of the episodes of the podcast, Working Title, a Podcast, or WTAP. Apparently they're changing their name soon. And they interview James Gurney, the creator of Dinotopia. So if you haven't read the book Dinotopia or any of the many sequels, 
I highly recommend them. Dinotopia was by far my favorite book when I was a kid, and it features a lot of paintings of dinosaurs and different environments, and it's a fictional world where humans basically get into a shipwreck and then they discover this whole world where dinosaurs and humans have been coexisting for a pretty long time, so they have this whole intricate society and the big dinosaurs are moving stuff around and the flying dinosaurs do stuff like guarding and, you know, patrolling the skies and all sorts of neat stuff going on. And then, you know, there's the old wise dinosaurs and the old wise people to go with them and everything like that. There's a lot of awesome illustrations. And in their interview, Gurney says that he was inspired by both Escher and Norman Rockwell for the way that it captivates you as well as the attention to detail and there is just a ton of detail in these books it's actually what drew me in so much was as much of the dinosaurs are the intricate engineering that you see everywhere in the interview they also cover how james decided the books were going to be set in the victorian era and apparently it was because it seemed more believable since there were still areas that people back then didn't really know about in the world they also talk about how Dinotopia, when it was published, filled a gap in the book world because illustrated books tend to be more for children. And that's still the trend today, but then you see some adult books, like Chronicle Books, for example, publishes uh, All My Friends Are Dead with the dinosaur on the cover. And I've got a master's in publishing, so I always perk up at the mention of book talk. But he said that they were lucky to find Turner Publishing, a boutique publisher, to develop and market the book for all ages, and that actually when Borders was around, it was categorized in the science fiction section for <laughs> adults. And we will be posting a link on our blog so you can listen for yourself, or you can also just search YouTube for WTAP Episode 4 James Gurney Interview. And that's it for the news. So as Garrett mentioned earlier, I had the pleasure of speaking with five of the people working on the game Saurian, which we've talked about in previous episodes. And thanks to Twitter, somebody tweeted at us that we, like, hey, you guys should really know about this game. And then also let the people at Saurian know about our podcast. So it's a really great way to meet some new people. But for those who might not be familiar with Saurian... Saurian is a video game focused on providing the most captivating prehistoric experience ever developed for commercial gaming, living like a true dinosaur in a dynamic open world through intense survival-based gameplay. Players will have the opportunity to take control of several different species of dinosaur in their natural environment. You will attempt to survive from hatchling to adult managing physical needs while avoiding predators and environmental hazards in a dynamic landscape reflecting cutting-edge knowledge of the Hell Creek ecosystem 66 million years ago. And this is from their website. So the five people I got to speak with included Nick Turinetti, the project lead of Saurian, and according to Saurian's website, quote, fearless leader, the OG, original gentle sore, occasional rexpert, end quote. He also does a lot of the research and marketing for Saurian, and when he's not working on Saurian, he works full-time at a railroad museum. And actually, everybody who works at Saurian right now does it in their spare time, which is amazing. They're working these crazy hours, and they're doing a beautiful job so far. Everything I've seen on the website and their videos has been amazing. There's also Henry Myers, the AI programmer from D.C. He has a B.A. in computer science and suffers from a deplorable excess of personality and plays the mandolin, banjo, and violin. He's pretty much a one-man bluegrass band. And these are descriptions that the team sent to me. So one quick note, we talk about this in the interview a little bit with Henry, how they are shelving the experimental reinforcement learning architecture that he's been working on. And they just posted a detailed blog post on September 19th, Saturday, if you want to learn a little bit more. He hopes to pick it up at some point, but to see where Sorian goes. And for people who are interested in seeing the work that he's done, They've released one of his experiments that you can download in that blog post. So if you go to the Saurian website, which we will be posting a link to on our blog, so you can see for yourself. There's also Brian Phillips, the animator. He lives in Idaho and is pretty much good at everything. He also has an emu named Jerry, who provides a lot of inspiration and reference to Brian's animations. There is Alejandra Soto, who's one of the programmers. She deals mainly right now with the player controller and making sure the dinosaurs move correctly. She currently resides in Madison, Wisconsin, and has fallen in love with cheese and beer. Yeah, cheese and beer. I'm from Wisconsin, so I'm a big fan of that sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, there was 
Maxim or Max Antonori, who's the lead programmer. And he actually, we were chatting through Skype and just one quick caveat, everybody or almost everybody in the Saurian group that I talked to, their Skype profile is of some kind of dinosaur image, <laughs> which is great. And Max, though, could not connect with us through the phone part of Skype. So he was typing in his responses and the rest of the team was reading it out for our benefit. But anyway, according to the Saurian site, he is, quote, a fearless Oculus fanboy and the first person in 66 million years to know what it's like to see like Tyrannosaurus, end quote. So now without further ado, here's our interview with Saurian. So players play in an open world environment in the Hell Creek Formation, and you design that based on the fossil record, and there's environmental hazards to contend with, including floods and fires and you can play as four different dinosaurs, including Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops. How did you choose these dinosaurs to make as players? The choice of like playable dinosaurs has kind of been a process. I think from the beginning, we were absolutely sure that we wanted to have Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops playable, just because that's, you know, pretty much since people knew that Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops lived together, they've like kind of established at least in pop culture, that there's a heated rivalry there. <laughs> and, you know, from what we can see in the fossil record, that's also true. There's, you know, lots of teeth mark bones on both sides of the battlefield, if you will. But the other two, we've considered, like, several other dinosaurs besides those two initially. And we kind of wound up settling on Pachycephalosaurus and a Cararaptor just because they offer, you know, a different experience from you know, the Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus, but also because, you know, they're kind of on the other end of the spectrum in terms of size. You know, a Cararaptor is quite small, um, and Pachycephalosaurus kind of bridges the gap between a Cararaptor and, like, say, the younger stages of Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops. So we have a lot of consideration into what we wanted to explore in terms of playable dinosaurs, and these four seem to offer the the most variety of experiences with the least amount of overlap from what we can tell from their, you know, inferred lifestyles. So did you pick the Hell Creek formation as the setting based on the dinosaurs you wanted? It kind of has always been front and center in our minds that we wanted to do Hell Creek. Number one, because unlike just about every other formation out there, there's just so much preserved in the Hell Creek formation. Like we have like extensive plant fossils. We have really, really precise stratigraphy. You know, like we can, we have a very good understanding of how old something is based on its position in the formation is. It also helps that, you know, most of the big famous dinosaurs that people know of come from the Hell Creek Formation. I mean, it, in one place, in one community, you have Tyrannosaurus rex, Triceratops, Ankylosaurus, Pachycephalosaurus, and no one usually talks about ductiles, but in Montosaurus, there are Anatosaurus is the, like the quintessential duck-built dinosaur. So it's, it's really kind of an all-star cast, and it would be hard to find that in any other formation that also has as much data about the whole ecosystem as well. I know you've done a lot of research, and you've consulted with a number of experts. So what role have they played in Sori, and how did you even find them to conduct your research? Well, first off, I'd like to preface any research on the Hell Creek Formation is always something that Tom and I, Tom is our map designer, and he's also like the primary uh, paleo fact checker. Anytime a new paper on the, that has to deal with the Hell Creek Formation comes out, we're kind of biting our nails going, okay, did we get it right, or are we going to have to redo something because we have new data to work with? And the most frustrating one is plants, because before this, neither he nor I knew very much at all about plants. And we're still not what I would consider experts, but we've picked up enough through our research to, to have a rough idea of how things go. And we sort of live in fear that the next hail plant paper is going to come out and completely upend everything we think we know because we don't know as much as we'd like to. <laughs> I think as far as connecting with experts, the first person that I really connected with who you know is a, is a paleontologist when we were working on Sorian is his name is Denver Fowler. He was a, or he is a student of Jack Horner's at University of, or the Museum of the Rockies in Montana. And I originally got a hold of him because 
because I had questions about Triceratops. And we were in the process of making the Triceratops model, which was one of the first ones that we made. And we were looking for advice. And essentially, all I did was email him. I found his personal website. I found his email address. And I sent him an email and said, hey, I'm Karen Eddy. I'm making a game called Sorian. I have some questions about Triceratops. Maybe you can answer them. And he was gracious enough to respond. And we've exchanged numerous emails back and forth on different um, subjects, you know, related to Soria. Mm -hmm. His specialty is actually, I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, is stratigraphic relationships. You know, how when you find a fossil in a formation, how you can tell how old it is or what its relationship is to other plants and animals or the rest of the formation. So he's been really awesome to talk to. I've learned tons every time I talk to him. That's amazing. I found paleontologists in general incredibly easy to, to reach out to. <laughs> I think what really helps if anyone is, is considering wanting to talk to paleontologists is they really value, in my experience, when you can come to them having you know, a little bit of background knowledge to begin with. I, as, as someone who I worked as a teacher for a short amount of time, and it's always much more refreshing to talk to somebody who's you know, at least got the a little bit of background information so you can launch into more complicated or higher level things without having to go back and explain from the beginning what, you know, stratigraphy is, what, you know, how fossil preservation works or stuff like that. Sure. Speaking of higher levels, this is a question that'll probably go to you, Henry. One of the most unique aspects, I think, of Saurian is the AI. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I have some sad news about that, actually. That's really sad for me to bring that up. But uh, kind of for the good of the project, I'm shelving the that uh, as a background for anyone that doesn't know, I developed a, uh, a kind of unique architecture for the AI that uses machine learning, which is pretty rarely found in video games. And as I learned, there's kind of a reason for that. And it's because there are, it's it involved a lot of experimentation to get what I wanted. And it involved research, and in the end, you know, we're in any game startup, we're in a really fragile position, and it's a risk to be in the situation where you have to be researching and experimenting when really we need to be developing. So I've been showing it for the time being. We'll be doing a press release about it soon. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was kind of a different uh, approach to AI in the sense that I didn't explicitly tell the AI what to do. I gave them a set of behaviors, and I gave them a way to perceive the environment. And instead of telling them what to do, they learned it themselves. It was really neat, and it was really fun to play around with. But in the end, it was just too much of a risk. I is uh, I couldn't necessarily control them to the degree that I wanted to, which sounds like some scary sci-fi stuff, and it kind of was. But we'll be releasing a, a little goodie for anyone that has actually been following the development so they can play around with learning AI in kind of a non-Saurian uh, context, but just to, just to see that it was a real thing. And then maybe one day down the road, once your local game is a thriving game company and we've moved on to the Morrison Formation or North Africa, <laughs> then uh, I can start resuming my research because this, that was really my code baby. And it was really sad for me to leave it behind, but it's priority number one to see Soaring get released. So I can't keep taking risks like that. So TLDR is if he had continued with it, we'd be looking at Dinosaur Skynet. Just basically, you can tell yeah. people that. <laughs> I mean, it already did happen. It was really interesting when the dinosaurs got out of control, which did happen frequently. Like, uh, sometimes the Triceratops would learn that it was actually to their advantage to be extremely aggressive. <laughs> they would just run around attacking all sorts of stuff. And eventually, they might unlearn it, but for a while, you get just these extremely aggressive Triceratops. <laughs> stuff like that. Which could be entertaining, but also needs to be able to do fast iteration for development and to be able to have really strict control. And one of the places I was doing research was how to have more control. But again, that was kind of a sidestep from getting dinosaurs to do what we wanted them to do. They have to do all this research and data collection and whatnot. Sure. So, just curious, the Triceratops being aggressive, were they aggressive amongst themselves or were they going after T-Rex or the other dinosaurs? <laughs> Basically all the other dinosaurs, yeah. <laughs> Uh, sometimes they'd be aggressive towards each other. It depends on whether or not, or it depends on the way that I allow them to perceive each other. But for the most part, they'd get aggressive towards the other dinosaurs. And in particular, it was really entertaining to see them. They one time, kind of by coincidence, learned that they really didn't like the Cellosaurs. So you could see them actually, they'd go running from halfway across the map to attack a Cellosaur, and they just go rampaging on them. 
<laughs> it was really entertaining, but also not what we wanted. Great. <laughs> Have you heard about the cube display in the Queensland University of Technology in Australia? Um, yeah, we actually did see that probably about the same time you mentioned it, where they're, uh, they sound like they're doing something similar to us in that they're using kind of video game development strategies to create a, uh, a, an exhibit that's focused on Australia's dinosaurs, correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. And actually, they're not the first ones to do this. One of the first groups... You might still be able to find it online. It was an exhibit called "Be the Dinosaur," and this exhibit was making you know museum tours about two or three years ago. And they are actually one of the major inspirations we had for Soarin' in the sense that this simulation that they had was allowed you to, like run around as the Tyrannosaurus or Triceratops in like two square kilometers of uh, of Hell Creek, and you had to worry about your hunger, you had to worry about predation, you had all these things to manage but it was designed as an integral part of this museum exhibit it really wasn't able to translate into like a video commercial setting and they did a ton of work on that and it's a little dated now that was one of the main inspirations for sorry so it's really cool to see that you know there are these kind of connections happening between technology you know and specifically a lot of game development and paleontology and dinosaur science and things like that. Yeah, very interesting. So you said that was the inspiration for Story, and did you have any kind of inklings that you wanted to do something like this beforehand, or how exactly did you come up with the idea? (laughs) I actually was still in college when I first came up with the idea, because I kind of enjoyed playing a video game called Spore, and I also enjoyed playing a video game called it's actually the Jaws Unleashed, which is a video game kind of based in the whole universe of the you know, Jaws shark from the movies. And between those two, the idea kind of hit me is that, you know, dinosaurs are a fantastically interesting subject, you know, almost universally. I, I don't know very many people who don't like dinosaurs in some capacity. And there's always a desire to kind of get a better understanding of what they were like or what they were really like or what it's like to try and live with dinosaurs or around dinosaurs or as a dinosaur. And video games are really unique because they're the one opportunity that you can put someone into the position of looking through another person's or another creature's eyes, but being more than just reading text, you can actually interact. And essentially, I'd been interested in dinosaurs for a long time, but real kind of coming to this realization that you could put yourself into the world of dinosaurs and experience this was really motivating and I kind of bounced around from different dinosaur related game projects you know I would be involved in some way or I'd follow them and it finally just occurred to me that nobody else was really looking to do the same thing that I had in mind so I might as well be the person who just started looking for other people who shared the same interests and hopefully we would coalesce enough that we could put something together and fortunately that's happened it's taken about three years but it's, it's happening so <laughs> yeah it's wonderful also, I, a couple of us just came up with this idea independently and then ran into each other through happenstance on the internet yeah, like brian <laughs> brian had his own game fleshed out if i had run into y'all i would have tried to do this myself <laughs> <laughs> so you guys kind of found each other online essentially yes like i met a couple of the people on the team on the forums of another dinosaur game. And, you know, we kind of talked and shared ideas and kind of came to the realization we could do this, but we didn't have nearly enough people to be able to do this. So we just sort of started by establishing that we wanted to be a project with the goal of creating a game where you live like a dinosaur. And we just sort of put that out there on social media. We, you know, looked through the forums for different game engines and you know I, I don't know how many of your fans are familiar with gaming but in indie development which is development that's not attached to like a big game studio it's it's groups of people mm-hmm. who are just actually trying to make video games essentially on their own there's a couple different they're called game engines which is just basically the tools to build your video game and you know we bounced we checked out different forums devoted to each of these and Eventually, you know, it was just a matter of we settled on, you know, we connected with another project who was making a game in one, in a uh, engine called CryEngine, and 
over time, we, as long as we were, you know, putting out the idea of having a game based in the Hell Creek formation featuring dinosaurs, people just eventually kind of came out of the woodwork. I mean, Brian, how did you find us exactly? Well, I found the, uh, the website for Chronosaurus, and I went through your Facebook and sent you that message. Yeah, which is really cool. And without going into, oh, you know, it's been three plus years that we've been doing this, there's been a lot of twists and turns and changes in direction. <laughs> and and uh, Max just said, we have a rule that teammates can never meet in person. <laughs> yeah, the universe implodes if we all get together one thing. Especially <laughs> Tom and Jake. <laughs> they'll, just, they'll just fight to the death. Unfortunately, they live on opposite sides of the planet. So one day we're going to own a communal house where we all have matching pajamas and we have bunk beds and a fire pole that we can you know, jump down and eat breakfast together before working. <laughs> That's the dream. That's the dream. So then how do you guys work with each other normally, since you're all far away? Pretty much via Skype. Skype is, is like our, the internet is what's making all of this possible, essentially. And Skype is our main vehicle of, like, team communication. We have, you know, a different cloud storage programs that actually houses different aspects of the game. But our main means of communication is via Skype. I know for, it seems like, uh, pretty much everyone on the team, this is kind of a side, kind of almost passion project at this point. You all have full-time jobs, so how do you factor that in? Because this is such a large undertaking, and you've done brilliant work so far, but I imagine it's taken a lot of time and energy. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah we usually get together in the evenings, and we all work together and stuff. Yeah. No, it's, it's some people's evenings. In Australia, it's Tom's mornings. In Europe, it's certain team members like middle of the nights if they if they're awake it, i think that's actually the biggest challenge is just it's it's not hard for once we get together in a group for us to make progress it's just our time zones are so incredibly varied that connecting is the biggest challenge i think because this is such a passion project for everybody it's not been difficult to stay motivated i mean we're all kind of still we're very much Yes, in love with the idea. So bigger, the biggest challenge is not so much motivation; it's communication. But also, we're getting to the point that there's things that need to be done that are going to require more time than just you know what we can devote you know out of our free time or time not spent you know doing real life things. And that's one of the reasons that we're still gearing up for crowdfunding. And, and looking for sources of financing outside of our own. Because if we can have finances available to have people say, hey, I only have to work 30 hours a week instead of the 65 I do now, that opens up time that goes to stronger, to uh, push on some of the more complicated parts of Sorry. So. Yeah. And bless you, Henry. I do. <laughs> Do you have any crowdfunding projects that you've been planning, or you're still in the early stages trying to figure out what platform? Um, I think we're definitely looking at Kickstarter, just because Kickstarter has such a huge community. And there's a risk, you know, with Kickstarter being an all-or-nothing mm -hmm. platform. But that's one of the reasons that we've taken so much time to build following, to build a community, and also to make sure that we're building something that actually fully showcases what Sorin is intended to be about. There's more than one game out there that's involved involves dinosaurs at this point in time, and we're a little bit notorious amongst people who are following all this for being quiet for you know much for two months at a time. Mm -hmm. But when we do show up with new stuff, it's always ooh ah this is amazing, and kind of what we're what we want to do with that is taken together. You can look and see there's real progress being made here. There's real concrete evidence that. We're able to do what we're saying we can do. Yeah. How many people are currently working on Solium? Oh, geez. Let's check the dev chat. Counting myself, there are 17 participants. And that includes everybody from, like, people who are testing the game in its current form to make sure that we don't have any, like, brandest bugs that will ruin everything later on down the road mm -hmm. to, like, uh, 3D modelers. We have several very accomplished artists who are working on things like creature design, landscape design, floral design. Brian is our animator, for example, and he's the one who makes everything 
as gorgeous as it is. <laughs> and oddly enough, like three out of four of our, three out of five of our programmers are in this call right now. So you have a great access to people who are actually playing with the nuts and bolts. So yeah, it's like you found a unicorn. It's never happened. Yeah, it's never happened. <laughs> Yeah, well, since we have so many of the programmers in here, maybe you guys could talk a little bit about what you do and how you work on Sorian. We like to work together. That's one thing, although that's hard to do. Right now, I'm in the, the process of doing major rewrites, but at least for me, it's kind of balancing the need to do kind of aesthetic-focused things, like inverse pneumatics, as opposed to like the underlying systems that go with them which are kind of less easy to show off because you can't really explain all the underlying code for perception and stuff when that's kind of going on visibly behind the scenes. But yeah, so it's kind of a mix for me. I don't know about how other people do it. So I'm working pretty much character controller right now. I'm making sure things move as they should. I'm also implementing the things you can do as the Akira Raptor as that's going to be our main playable right now. I don't know how much I can say about it, though. The things you can do. You can talk a little bit about it. Well, since the character is a, a small predator, we're going to make it very quick, very agile, nimble. You're going to be able to climb on trees and follow and prey, also hide out on trees if, you know, something's chasing you. We've also made it so that you can chase small prey, like some lizards and things, which is actually very fun to chase and yes. wrangle around. I think that's uh, Henry's most amusing progress up to date is... Scuttlebuns. Scuttlebuns. <laughs> Scuttlebuns. Scuttlebuns. I was really excited for Obamadon because there was a lizard named Obamadon, which is like the funniest thing I've ever heard. But instead, our kind of main lizard right now is Jamops. And yeah, this person simply simple AI for the lizard running away. It's, it's really not that exciting. It's just really, really fun to chase it. What makes it so fun? Just It's got a bunch of randomness built into its fleeing algorithm. So like it'll kind of juke you sometimes. It'll... It's not very predictable, so you really have to kind of be on your toes when you're chasing it if you want to catch it. Henry's also programmed the lizard to be quite fast, as in a carabat. The thing that is kind of interesting, and this is where actual, you know, scientific studies kind of come into play with Sorian, is that our Caraptor is not, you know, the, the typical Jurassic Park cheetah speed, like fast pursuit predator that popular culture makes it out to be. Uh, Brian, how fast did you manage to get a Caraptor this time around? 15 miles an hour. Yeah, so a Caraptor is an animal that in size is probably akin to a coyote. Mm -hmm. And it's not very fast. It runs at 15 miles an hour. And well, so, it does feel very fast, but it's not very large. Yeah. So if you're, you're zooming around, you really feel like you're going fast. But then a T-Rex comes along and just flies past you. Yeah, and the T-Rex is doing like a, not really stretching itself to move at 20. You know, and it just looks like it's passing you like you're standing still. So, I mean, some of it is related to, you know, how large you are versus, you know, your perception of speed. But the bottom line is that we know from looking at dromaeosaur bones and their proportions that they weren't fast animals. They weren't high-speed running pursuit animals. They were probably more like cats where they would be about ambush or short chases and then grappling with the prey. And so when you pit an animal that's not really built for speed against this little lizard that's highly maneuverable and is just about as fast as a Caraptor. It's quite challenging to try and actually get close enough to actually eat it. <laughs> and that's where a lot of the uh, a lot of the interest comes in. We were watching Henry run around chasing one in a test map the other night. And did you ever even come close to catching one? Yeah, I did. All of you were making fun of me because I couldn't find it in the bushes, but I totally did. <laughs> So one of your team members listed on your site is Jerry, and that is Brian's emu. <laughs> How has Jerry influenced Sorian? <laughs> so quite a bit. I actually have a high-speed video of him running, which is, if you look close to the wrecks, you can really see there's a bit of emu in him. Also, he, he's a huge morale boost. He yeah. gets more support. We, we've done a couple live streams, like we'll you know, just decide, okay, tonight two, three, four of us are going to work on something and we'll stream it for anybody who's interested. And I think universally, if we're doing that, anytime Brian has Jerry there, like everybody, everybody comes out of the woodwork to see Jerry, just because I don't think too many people actually get a chance to get up close and personal with an emu, even if it is over a webcam. But 
<laughs> it's pretty awesome. Yeah. What has inspired your artistic vision for Sorian? It's kind of weird to talk about that because none of us are strictly speaking on the art team. So I don't know if you're familiar with some of our artists, but RJ Palmer is kind of well known for his take, his realistic takes on Pokemon. And he joined us a little, almost, almost two years ago now. And he's been really instrumental in kind of making sure that we kind of make sure for him that he's, you know, quote unquote, following the rules, you know, making sure that he's not, you know, using color that doesn't seem to be possible for dinosaurs to have generated or, you know, making sure that, you know, the anatomy of the creatures he's designing fits with the fossils. Mm -hmm. He really, he brings a really neat artistic viewpoint to our dinosaur design. Like he's, and you can kind of see that showcased in our Rex design. It's not all RJ. It was like a group effort between all four of our concept artists. Mm -hmm. But he was the driving force to kind of say that I think we can do better than what we did the first time around. The other person on our team who's really been active lately is Chris Masna, and he's a really awesome paleo artist. If you want, you can check him out on DeviantArt. He's got some really fantastic stuff out. Uh, and then the third member of our team is Alex Blumko, and Alex is fantastic at looking at actual fossils and kind of looking at what their bone texture tells us and, you know, how muscles attach to bone and giving us a really awesome idea of the animal's appearance. And it's not quite ready yet, but he did a ton of work on our anatosaurus. Like, literally went to American Museum of Natural History in New York and actually went and photographed the mummy that's on display there and, like, took hundreds of photos of it to the point that we... We really don't have a whole lot of wiggle room with an Anatosaurus because we know so much about what it looked like. And it's been a really big challenge for us to make sure that we're matching our model and our designs to, you know, the actual fossil. So it's kind of a little bit of a rambling answer as to, as to what our inspiration is. There's, I mean, we can also say, like, I mean, I'm not an artist on the team, or not in the traditional sense, but, like, I've been super influenced by All Yesterdays by John Conway. Like, just because the way that it depicted, not only the way the dinosaurs looked, but their behavior, you know, like that, that image of the Allosaurus and the Camptosaurus just kind of hanging out and looking at each other. You know, it's just something you never see dinosaurs depicted doing. Well, if you watch nature documentaries, if you ever see wild animals interact, they have all sorts of unpredictable behavior like that, you know, that you never see them getting depicted doing, especially dinosaurs. Because dinosaurs, whenever you see them, they're almost always depicted fighting. So, I mean, it's definitely cool for me that I want to make sure that you're going to see the AI dinosaurs, you're going to see a T-Rex hanging out next to Triceratops and not fighting. That's, so yeah. Oh, yeah, it's tricky, but we'll, we'll aim for it. <laughs> it's definitely going to be possible the way I'm thinking that. If they don't have a way to attack each other, then, or if they don't have a reason to, like if the T-Rex isn't on the trike's territory and it's not hungry, the trike isn't feeling particularly aggressive, then... Yeah, that makes sense. I think just then kind of as a further, I feel like I didn't quite fully answer the your question, but major influences besides all yesterdays, I think we can really handily point to even some of the old, really old paleo art masters like Charles Knight uh, has been really influential because of the way that he really grounded his dinosaurs and his paintings in their environment. They look like they belong in this ecosystem. They're just not sort of plastered against the generic backdrop. And I think the real master of that and the person who's been kind of has the most influence, even though he probably doesn't know or maybe not even particularly care, is Doug Henderson. And Douglas Henderson is probably the best person that I know of who does dinosaurs in their environment to the point that he makes dinosaurs look small in their world. Like they're just one small cog in, in a Cretaceous or Jurassic landscape. Going back to the redesign of the T-Rex, which I saw that post and it looked really cool. Just in general, how often do you do redesigns? Do you find yourself incorporating new data a lot? I would say that we try our best to make sure that we take into account as much of the new data that's even unpublished yet that we've, you know, just had reliable conversations with people about. Essentially, we try to avoid, you know, remaking the wheel whenever possible. But every now and then there's something that will come down, you know, as far as a discovery the real driver in the case of the Rex was that model that we had was built for a different game engine. It was built to run in CryEngine. And trying to bring it into Unity caused so many development headaches that we needed to do something. And that's kind of outlined in the 
mostly. And it was sort of a convenient time to revisit the Rex too, because as I'm sure you can guess, most of our development team really, really, really likes Tyrannosaurus Rex and really, really wants to be involved in making it look as good as it can. So I think the Rex was a little unique just in terms of we needed something, we it needed an update for technical reasons. And as long as we were going to go in and look at it technically, why not incorporate some of those new findings and, you know, give our artists a chance to kind of flex their muscles a little bit. Having said that, we are actually right now working on some tweaks to our Triceratops model. It's going to better match the fossil skin that we do have of Triceratops. And it's also getting a few anatomical corrections based on, like, for example, my discussions with Denver Fowler, just because he's got such a unique perspective. He's seen hundreds of Triceratops skulls in the field. The Museum of the Rockies has an enormous collection of Triceratops individuals. And so he's got a very unique perspective on if you want to make a Triceratops really look like a Triceratops, here's what you should do. Yeah. So, okay, in Saurian, how are you making the Triceratops the posture? Because I know, depending on who you ask, they say, well, people used to think it was sprawled, and then now it's more upright or somewhere in between. It's kind of, it's, it's unfortunate this is like a uh, little conversation, because I could show you a, po- a picture of our tri posed from the front, and if you want, I can give you one of those for the uh, post. But, Great. um... Our triceratops, ceratopsians in general are really weird because most people, when they think about animals that walk on four legs, if you were to, you know, get on your hands and knees, your fingers face straight forward. And that's what we call pronation, you know. And most people, when they hear pronation in dinosaurs, think back to, you know, theropods with little bunny hands where their palms face, you know, towards themselves. Mm -hmm. And what's really weird with ceratopsians is that their hands are not pronated. They're um, what's called supination. And most dinosaurs have supinated hands where their palms face each other. It's the whole clappers versus slappers argument is the best way I've heard to describe it. Ceratopsians' hands, so their palms face each other, but their fingers are so twisted that they face forward, and they kind of have this radial arrangement. They are, if you ever look at the hands of the ceratopsian, you have to be careful which ones you look at. And our model has accounted for this new posture. They have They almost have what's like a horseshoe arrangement of their digits. They form sort of a semicircle. And because their palms are facing each other, it kind of naturally pushes their elbows out. When you arrange their bones the way that, basically the only way they can fit together without, you know, like disarticulating, they kind of naturally wind up in a semi-sprawled posture. And what's really cool is that it's not in a museum, but there is a specimen of Triceratops called Raymond. And Raymond is like the only Triceratops I know of that was found reasonably articulated. And his arm is in pretty much life articulation, and it shows that it has sort of a semi-sprawled elbow that points out. That's interesting. Cool. So I know you've got a, a post about this on the website. Where do you guys stand on the Taurosaurus debate? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I think I'll just preface this by saying that Denver Fowler, being a student of Jack Horner and being intimately involved with the research that, you know, everybody got very animated about with Horosaurus being the adult Triceratops, based on what he shared with us and some of the papers that are now finally coming out that he shared, you know, background information on with us a while back, my personal understanding of it is that what you see in Taurosaurus is most likely the adult form of Triceratops, with the little asterisk to say that since we know that Triceratops changed significantly over, you know, the roughly 1.2 to 1.5 million years of the Hell Creek formation, that I don't think it's unreasonable to think that the mass of changes that we see in the animal can largely be explained by if we had data for where each of these Taurosaurus skulls came from, you'd probably see that most Taurosaurus, like ones, the ones with a really big frill, uh, some specimens of Taurosaurus don't actually really even have a nose horn. They just kind of have a little boss on the tip of their snout. I think if we, if you really had good data for where they were found, you'd find the really, really Taurosaurus-like skulls are from very, they're the oldest ones. They're the ones that are like 68, 69 million years old. And they just sort of progressively become more and more Triceratops-like the younger they get, younger geologically they get. I don't know, do Brian, Henry, and Alejandro, I don't know if you guys have a strong opinion on Taurosaurus and Triceratops. It's it's obviously a very... 
I think you did a pretty thorough job right there. Yeah. <laughs> Don't look at me. I just heard the big bird make things move. <laughs> but you do fantastically. Let's not argue that. So I wanted to go ask you, Alejandro, since you're in charge of making sure the dinosaurs move correctly, when there are redesigns, you have to go back and kind of rework everything, like with the T-Rex? So that's kind of a team thing. Uh, Brian makes the animations and I put them back in the game. But yes, if there's a redesign and the break changes, then I do have to remake a bunch of stuff. You guys maybe want to talk about root motion really briefly? Yeah, I was just about to say, the last round we did with the, the Rex has made it a lot easier to get really good fluid movement for everyone. Because it was in, was it Unity? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's um, a thing that's called root motion, and basically you get the motion of the animation from the animation itself. You don't really have to tell... You don't have to tell the dinosaur that it has to move at this set speed with numbers and code. It just takes it from the animation, which is something new that we didn't have before. And it's really cool. It makes things a lot easier to implement. Wonderful. So this is a question from actually one of our listeners, Cole. How many animals is Saurian going to include? And is it really going to be just from the Hell Creek formation? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, This is probably the number one question we get besides will it be on Steam and when will it release? <laughs> Which I was going to ask later. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a nicer answer than just saying we don't know. But I think one of the reasons we've been really hesitant to give any sort of description of how many animals will be in the game is because we are still in the midst of early development. There are a lot of things we have to figure out in terms of the exact way we want to handle different challenges. Just to give you an example... We were talking earlier about Henry chasing around Chamops, which is a lizard that's a, under a meter long as a Caraptor, which is an animal about two and a half to three meters long at most. And one of the things we discovered is when we plunked this little Chamops model down into a fully foliaged and textured environment, it's darn near invisible. It's really challenging to follow. And even with a very bright color scheme it has, it's ridiculously easy for this thing to disappear (laughs) and that's one of the things that we're going to have to consider is there are tons and tons and tons of little animals from hell creek there are i think that's one of the things that people don't necessarily always realize is that there are you know well over a dozen different types of lizard there are well over a dozen different types of mammals and some of them are the size of a mouse or the size of a shrew and i don't think that's at all feasible to try and include in a game where you're still playing as an animal that, even though it's small, would not notice most of these animals in its day-to-day life. Mm -hmm. So that really influences, you know, to a large extent, which animals we include. The larger goal, I think, is that we we want people to, who are maybe not terribly familiar with Mesozoic environments or the Hell Creek Formation, to actually, when they're playing the game, have moments of discovery just to say, oh, wow, this thing was here. Or I had no idea that there were, you know, six foot long salamanders that looked like eels in Hell Creek, which there were. So essentially, it's, it's one of those things where to answer the second part of your question, we're largely focused on including animals who we know for sure were in Hell Creek. And that's kind of one of the things that I also feel makes us unique is that we're not picking and choosing animals from different times and different places. We want the experience to be when you're playing this game, you're looking at an actual plants and animals. Joe really, really, I mean, everyone really, really, really wants an Alamosaurus, but <laughs> we just couldn't justify it. Yeah, so I'm, if anybody doesn't, if anybody's not familiar, my username for a long time on different forums was Jomaria, and Jomaria is a sauropod. They're probably my favorite dinosaurs, and it was really cool to learn a couple years ago that Almosaurus is probably one of the largest sauropods to ever exist, and it not being in Saurian is a little bit of a sad point, but I'm proud of it. In the future, I know, since you don't have a release date yet for Saurians, this might seem very far into the future, but you did mention before about uh, Morrison formation, other formations you think you'd expand, or have different areas? Ryan's going to hold the, hold the whole operation hostage until we do an Oceans of Kansas. <laughs> 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 so if yeah. we don't kill each other before the game is out, <laughs> sorry is out, then I think it's safe to say that we might move on to other things. 
It, it's a big if. Like, if we are a huge runaway success, which, you know, if we time our release correctly and we release it before Jurassic World 2 or whatever, and we just get a ridiculous amount of money like Ark did, then I would be really into that idea. Yeah. But the true big if part is that you know, there are people asking all the time, will you do this, will you do that? And kind of as we alluded to a little earlier, the Hell Creek Formation is really, really special just because we know so much about the entire ecosystem, not just the dinosaurs, not just, you know, the big charismatic things. And I think if we were going to look at future candidates, we'd have to look for formations and times and places that offered a comparable amount of information. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, essentially we're building all of our assets, like our plants, our all that sort of stuff from scratch. And in many cases, there are very limited resources available to even try and understand what some of these things look like. I mean, trees usually don't preserve in their entirety. You get a leaf or you get a stump that's gone through a forest fire and then was washed downstream in a flood, buried in a bunch of mud, and then was only half preserved. You know, so <laughs> it's stuff like that that the fossil record has to really, really great from a location. You need to have a really good understanding of the temporal relationship between fossils to be able to do what we're doing. You mentioned before you want the game to be a place people can discover things about the Hell Creek Formation. I feel like you do a really good job of projecting that also onto just your website and your social media platforms because in addition to posting like teasers about the game, you can learn a lot about dinosaurs. You've got infographics and then your images and your videos and different blog posts. And even, like, the, the whole post about the Hell Creek Formation, which is awesome. And you've got such a big online community, too, with 7,000 likes on Facebook, more than 1,900 subscribers on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I know, and you're active with your live streams. It, it feels like I, you've definitely got a good community behind you. Like, how have they influenced the development of Saurian? Well, to be perfectly honest... We're here talking with you today because one of our followers pointed you guys out that you had mentioned us. And so, I mean, that alone, I think, has been great to have people really are just following us from the outside come to us and say, hey, have you guys seen this? It's really cool. Or have you guys heard about, you know, I know Dino because they featured you and it was really cool. I think if you took a broader look, I mean, people like Brian and Henry are here because they were fans who had skills which they felt would push Saurian forward, and they took they you know they took the step to actually reach out to us and say, hey, I can help, and here's how I can help, and it, that's something that's happened multiple times over the course of this project. It's that our community comes through for us in different ways, and it's not always in ways that the rest of the community can see. There are plenty of people who reach out to us privately, you know, and say, hey, I can do this. We we had someone. In one of our live streams, Jake was in the process of sculpting Quetzalcoatlus, and we didn't have a good reference for Quetzalcoatlus' feet. And it took her about five minutes, and she posted this great high-resolution picture of an articulated Ashdarkin foot. Bam! There we go. So I feel like they've contributed in many, many small ways, and sometimes in larger ways but that isn't necessarily visible to the rest of the public. So I think uh, at least the biggest thing the community does for us is morale. It's yeah. always so exciting to see people be excited about something we're doing. And we get like emails all the time, people saying that, oh, this is a game of my dreams. I'm so happy you guys are doing this. And that just kind of gives you a warm feeling. And it's, it's like, oh, you know, somebody enjoys something you're doing. Even if it's not done yet, like they're super excited about it. Yeah, it's like people that say they've been waiting for this their whole life. It's like, yes, we're not the only ones. <laughs> That's a really good feeling. Can I just ask about the live stream? There's at least one case that a nine hour long live stream. That is education. <laughs> yeah. Well, you'll notice we haven't done those regularly. So. <laughs> we do love our live streams, so. though. Yeah. So it's a good time. Uh, to be perfectly honest, what happened in that live stream is pretty much just one of our like extended work calls, just with other people there to watch it. I mean, we don't really behave all that much differently in live streams than we do when we're working on stuff in a group call. And I think if you were just watching like the duration of the Skype calls we do, I mean, nine hours is not exceptional for us. There are some days that there's a call going for like 15 or 16 hours and people 
you know, hop in or drop out as they're available. Didn't we keep a couple on for like 24, 26 hours? Maybe at one point. I think there were there times. Yeah, but I think there's been a couple times where like you've traded off who's hosting the call and in total it lasted almost 24 hours. Yeah. I work during the day. I don't always know what happens around here. It's, it's kind of funny to come back and you look at Skype and you have like 300 messages and there are links to all sorts of different things. Like here's our link to a different fossil. Here's a link to some plants. Here's a link to a funny picture of something or whatever. It, it's all over the place. <laughs> How are you incorporating feathers into your dinosaurs? Everywhere. Everywhere? All feathers. <laughs> I mean, are you asking like... Just kind of want to point out, like, I know you're adding feathers, which is awesome, and you've done a lot of the research, and it seems like there's a lot of debate over, you know, types of feathers, how many feathers, things like that. Ah, we draw on a lot of different resources for feathers. I think the biggest one is that it's, Tom is really a lot better at talking about this than I am, but something that is just kind of becoming more common in actual dinosaur studies is using data from What's the, it's, it's usually shorthanded as Evo Devo. It's looking at how living birds and crocodilians actually develop their outer covering, you know, be it scoots, scales, armor, feathers, from like their actual genetic processes. Like, how do they go from a little embryo to a fully fledged chick? And looking at how birds do this and how crocodiles do this, you can draw out a lot of common comparisons or, you know, commonalities, and that makes sense because they're each other's closest living relatives. But looking at how and when birds develop feathers and what those feathers look like has been really informative to us. When you combine it with fossil evidence, like, you know, everybody's should be familiar with Kulindodromius, which is the uh, the little ornithician from Siberia that's you know, really, really fluffy, but also has, like, scaly legs and a scaly tail, mm-hmm. which you can probably pick out from our... The Celosaurus was quite influential. But taking data from more than just the fossils, more than just, you know, what's called the extant phylogenetic bracket, basically dinosaurs are sort of in between crocodiles and birds in terms of, you know, relationships. They're in between, so to speak. And when you bracket them, bracket an extinct animal by living species and what their behaviors, their appearance, stuff like that, is also informed. So we kind of are going beyond just the fossil record, just the extent phylogenetic bracket, and actually looking at genetics to some extent. And that's, Tom's much better about talking about that than I am. He's actually going to school for stuff like that. So, oh, but I guess in a nutshell, that would be how, that's one of the ways of with feathers. And the challenge for a lot of times is that I know that many, many people are dubious about, for example, Tyrannosaurus having feathers or Tyrannosaurus rex specifically having feathers. Mm -hmm. And I think the important thing to remember is that the fossil record, for as fantastic as it can be, is still only a tiny, tiny little window. It's like getting one or two puzzle pieces out of a 500-piece puzzle and trying to figure out what the whole thing looks like from these few little bits. You know, it's imperfect. It's very spotty. And just because we haven't discovered fossil, you know, feathers or, or, for example, with a specific dinosaur is not really all that telling in terms of if it actually had them. We have to look broader than that and look at places where we do have really awesome fossil preservation to be informed. So really quick, who designed your logo? Because it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the red and black um, with the T-Rex and Triceratops for our listeners. <laughs> well, that was actually... Chris Masner's work. And Chris is actually, he does draftsmen. He works like with architects and stuff like that. He does design as part of his day job. He paleos on his free time. And he just sort of said, hey, we could use a logo if anyone feels like playing around with it. And he just sketched that up one day. He was like, wow, we want this. And you know, it's gone through a little bit of refining to make sure that the, the actual, the anatomy of the logo better matches <laughs> our animals. <laughs> He's an awesome awesome artist yeah it's really cool well everyone on your team is incredibly talented definitely shows (laughs) and the things that i've seen on the website at least so do you guys have a favorite dinosaur i know you might all have a different one but you mentioned around alamosaurus 
Yeah, I, I'm kind of a fan of sauropods in general, but I do really like Allosaurus too. I guess this is kind of open to everybody else. What do you guys think as far as your favorites? Utah Raptor. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Big drum sword. That's just, that's just really cool. Max says Tesselo. Mine would be Dromaeus. Aww. <laughs> Mine is whichever I'm working on right now. <laughs> Which in this case is the Akira Raptor. Yeah, that Akira is just a huge cutie. I'm a really big fan of cute raptors. Cute raptors don't get enough love. So... What's the best way for fans to keep up with you guys? I think if you want to keep your finger on the pulse of Saurian, it's kind of a three-way split between our Tumblr, our Facebook, and Twitter. Because we're really, we're probably most active on those three platforms. And I guess the, the bigger point I would make, though, is that we've got something big coming if something awesome and exciting is going to happen. If you're following any one of those, we're obviously going to tell you because we want you to be just as excited about stuff as we are. And I'm going to tease you just as bad as I tease the rest of these guys. There are a couple really exciting new things coming out of Hell Creek in the very near future. And I hate you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> he won't tell us. It's really frustrating. I hate you so much. So, so just so everybody knows, I know what they are. They'll be aware of it very soon, <laughs> and everybody else will be having their jaw on the floor. Yeah, but he's been teasing at this for months. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's like actual torture. <laughs> and every time, we're just sitting around having a good time, having a work on, and then just Joe just offhandedly goes like, oh yeah, and this new thing that's coming up, and everyone's like, Joe, please. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have at least a timeline for when people um, will know? My sources tell me it's supposed to be sometime this month. It's essentially waiting for a paper to be published, and I'm not that well connected to tell you when it will be published. <laughs> I wish I was, but I'm not. Well, good to know. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today, guys. I know you're all very busy. Yeah, thank you. Just a quick heads up. If any of your listeners are in Boston or anywhere in the Northeast, on September 21st through the 23rd, Max, our programmer, is going to be at a Unite conference, which is a conference for Unity developers. And if you can find the guy wearing the big Saurian shirt, which has Chris's awesome logo on it and the big Rex infographic on the back, he might just be persuaded to give you guys a chance to demo. Oh, that would be awesome. I wish we were based near there. <laughs> <laughs> That's our brief shout out. Maybe we'll be nice enough and send you a little copy of later on. Yeah, if you want to, that would be amazing. So thank you again, and we'll be sure to post links in our show notes. Let our listeners know this is an amazing. Like Garrett and I are really excited now. Like we're <laughs> we're on that boat now. Of like, when will you be releasing? Where? <laughs> <laughs> when Steam release? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely keep you guys in the loop. Anytime you want to chat, just you know, let me know. We're happy to talk about Sorry, and it's one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks again to the Saurian team for a great interview. So I just want to mention in the interview, Nick talked about Eureka Exhibit's Be the Dinosaur exhibit, and we will be posting a link to that in our show notes if you want to check that out. Now for our dinosaur of the day, Akira Raptor, which is one of the four playable Saurian dinosaurs, and their other playable dinosaurs include T-Rex, Triceratops, and Pachycephalosaurus. The name Akira Raptor comes from Akiran, the river of pain in the underworld in ancient Greek mythology. Then they named it because it was found in the Hell Creek Formation. And then Raptor is Latin for robber, which is a common name used for other dromaeosaurids. Akira Raptor is a dromaeosaurid. And they shortened the name Akiran so that it would sound better with Akira Raptor instead of Akiran Raptor. Akira Raptor lived in the late Cretaceous. Again, it was found in the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. The holotype specimen is found in 2009 by commercial fossil hunters, and then it was purchased by the Royal Ontario Museum from a private collector. It was described and named by David C. Evans, Derek W. Larson, and Philip J. Curry in 2013. In their paper, A New Dromaeosaurid, Dinosauria Theropoda, with Asian Affinities from the Latest Cretaceous of North America, in Nature Wissenschaften. There is one species, it's Achiroraptor temertiorum, and the name Temertiorum is for husband and wife James and Louise Temerty, 
and James is the chairman of Northland Power and the Royal Ontario Museum Board of Governors. A Raptor is known from an almost complete maxilla with teeth and an associated dentary, which is basically jawbones. The holotype is the nearly complete right maxilla, but there is also a nearly complete left dentary, the anterior bone of the lower jaw, which is possibly from the same individual, but it's not confirmed. It might be from two individuals. A Raptor had a long snout and dagger-like teeth and was probably covered in feathers. It was bipedal, about 10 feet or 3 meters long, and weighed about 88 pounds or 40 kilograms. Saurian has some beautiful concepts of a Raptor, and you can find examples all over the website, plus an animated gif that shows the process of a sketch of a Raptor, which is the result of their 9-hour-long livestream session. And according to Saurian, a Raptor is completely covered in feathers and has a dark greenish body with white feathers on its legs, light brown feathers on the tail and arms. It has large eyes and menacing teeth, and it's very bird-like. And of course, it has the sickle claw. A Raptor is also the first playable Saurian dinosaur released to the public. It won't fly, but according to them, may, quote, fall with style. You can see a video of a Raptor on the Saurian website in action walking, running, eating, ruffling its feathers, jumping, and gliding. And what's interesting about Akiraraptor is the discovery of it. It gives a lot of information about dinosaurs in North America in the late Cretaceous. Uh, according to the paleontologist who named it, it shows there was possibly a decline in raptor diversity at the time. Because Akiraraptor is so closely related to Asian species, also from the late Cretaceous, this suggests that there were migrations from Asia until the end of the Cretaceous. And Akiraraptor is the only dromaeosaur from the Hell Creek Formation, according to the three paleontologists who described it. This means that the teeth previously found of Dromaeosaurus and Sornitholestes are now considered to be Akiraraptor. There's other theropods, just not dromaeosaurids from the Hell Creek Formation, and in general, some other dinosaurs you can find in the Hell Creek Formation include Tyrannosaurids, Ornithomimids, Ornithischians, Ceratopsians, and Hadrosaurs. Akiraraptor is the geologically youngest known Dromaeosaurid species. It's considered to be a Velociraptorine, which is a subfamily of Dromaeosauridae, and it's more closely related to Asian Dromaeosaurids, such as Velociraptor, than others from North America. Dromaeosaurids are carnivorous theropods closely phylogenetically related to aves, which is a clad that includes birds. They probably originated before the late Jurassic, but the fossil record so far is only of the Cretaceous. They lived all over the world, but there are not that many fossils. And Dromaeosaurids from the late Cretaceous in North America have an especially poor fossil record. They're known mostly from isolated teeth. In North America, only eight species have been named, and these are, again, based on incomplete fossils, fossil remains. They're often referred to as raptors because of Jurassic Park, and dromaeosaurids had S-curved necks, long arms, and large hands with large claws. Their feet had a recurved claw on the second toe, called a sickle claw, and this claw may have been used for slashing, climbing, or even clawing through insect nests. At least some of them may have lived in groups. Most, if not all, had feathers. They were bipedal, but when they were walking or running, they held their second toe off the ground. They had long tails that may have been used to help counterbalance, and they were generally small to medium-sized, though some were large, like Utah Raptor. And some could fly or glide, like Chengyu Raptor Yangyi. And they were very bird-like. This is based on both their behavior and the fact that they had feathers. And now our fun fact of the day. I'm sure we've mentioned the KT extinction that wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs, and the fact that it paved the way for mammals before on the podcast. But you may not know that the Permian extinction, known as the, quote, Great Dying, occurred right before dinosaurs came into being, and it may have led the way to archosaurs and later dinosaurs being so successful. So thanks again to everyone who helped us achieve our first milestone goal on Patreon. There was an article we were trying to get a hold of on Archaeoraptor, but it was behind a paywall and... That's our next goal. So if you want to contribute, you can go to patreon.com slash I know dino. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And we appreciate all the support. It really means a lot to us. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at 
iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.